Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Super excited to be talking about cell-free molecular discovery. Very excited to have Dr. Lewis Metzger joining us on the show. Hello. Really excited to be here. Thanks, Alan. Thanks so Appreciate much for coming it. on. Very pumped. Very pumped. This is the edge of biotech. We're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about your journey. Very excited. For those that don't know, Lewis's background. He initially did a PhD at Duke in biochemistry. Then he went on and did a postdoc at UCSF. Then he became a principal scientist at Novartis for about six years, discovering novel antibiotics. Then, most recently, he's been a year with, as the chief scientific officer at Tierra Biosciences, where he's doing cell-free synthetic biology, searching for molecules. Very, very excited to be talking about this, um, and so much more. You yeah. know, there's so much more in the background as well. It's all in the bio. Um, okay, Lewis, we like to start things off with this big history perspective on civilization. What is your current take on the synthesis of the human experiment? Well, I mean, it's, it's, these are the best of times in some ways, and they're scary and dangerous times in other ways. But I, I would say we're in an interesting place because I don't think that humanity has fundamentally changed in its desires and motivations for thousands of years. But our technology has certainly changed. And uh, one perspective I have is that we're at the point where we can precisely engineer biology. Now, to be clear, people have, humanity has been engineering its world for you know, millennia. I mean, hunting you know, megafauna to extinction, uh, you know, changing you know, the, very, the very nature of the land uh, that they live in, and also doing genetic experiments with low uh, precision. So look at all the breeds of dogs that we have today. You know, that is the result of human selection and you know, engineering of biology, as it were and farm animals and crops and everything else. So, but now we're at this point, everyone, you know, we've, many people have heard about CRISPR and numerous other technologies that allow us to precisely engineer biology. And I think that's going to be the hallmark of the coming century. I think if we had you know, an industrial revolution, um, a silicon revolution, those revolutions have set up a biological revolution. And uh, I think that uh, this, is, this is an interesting time uh, uh, to live. And at the same time, I think that we, humanity oscillates, especially with modern communications, between being pulled closer together in some ways and, you know, other forces trying to move people into tribes. So it's easier to find your tribe on social media or in the workplace or uh, wherever you look for your tribe. Um, and it's easier to communicate with people than ever, but in many ways, uh, perhaps because of that, we're more isolated than ever uh, in some ways and more connected in others. So it's it, all, all these uh, objective, you know, these, these, these opposites that we have uh, are, make this time really interesting. And um, I, hope, I hope that humanity can traverse uh, this period and, uh, and find uh, sort of a humanistic outcome uh, for, for people. For instance, uh, all of this automation that, that we see in biology, in, 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 in so many other areas, uh, does eventually eliminate certain types of jobs, but it creates others. And is humanity going to reach some sort of technical singularity where we can uh, take care of everyone, give people a good quality of life, and then what does, what does wealth look like in that situation? Is it freedom to be creative, uh, to have that sort of most limiting resource time? So anyway, my, my take on humanity is that we can engineer everything better and better. Uh, we're entering a time uh, where you know, we, we reach a point where humanity can pro probably provide for its needs if it finds a way to do so uh, that doesn't leave anyone behind. And so I think that's, that's the risk that goes along with the benefit of, of how we're evolving. Ah, this is a $100 trillion opportunity as we've been circulating in the media now with it in the bio article and stuff. It's very exciting what biotechnology and the engineering of everything that our world actually is made of can potentially uh, bring in civilizational flourishing. It's super exciting. I'm glad you um, really are 
so passionate about that. And in, we're going to break down a lot of these regards in terms of like the scientific, the foundation of scientific knowledge. We're going to talk about that later as well. I'm really excited. Um, okay, take us down the the kind of like your you're a little bit about the on the childhood. What got you into biotech? What got you into what you were doing at Duke and whatnot? Take us through that. So um, I don't know. Some of the people who are watching this may have. Uh, uh, read a book by Oliver Sacks. Um, I think it's called Uncle Tungsten. And uh, it, among other things, it makes the point uh, of how uh, childhood chemistry sets can be useful. Uh, uh, for me, uh, it was actually a, a kid's microscope set uh, that my parents bought me for, I don't know, my fifth or sixth or seventh birthday, a long time ago, uh, or so it seems. And uh, they are not scientists, uh, my parents, but uh, they're very bright people who had a great love of nature and you know we I grew up in the desert southwest so we went on hikes we you know we we really were encouraged to explore and I think that 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 wet my appetite for not only could we observe interesting things through telescopes on the you know at the sort of the large end of the scale but we could observe things that were invisible under microscopes and there was all this biology and chemistry happening all around us that we can't even see yeah. uh, without special equipment. And so I think that microscope did that for me. Uh, but in addition to that, um, I, I went to a public high school. Uh, I really, really uh, had a good time there. Uh, it was uh, Cibola High School in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I had two, two I have many teachers who influenced me quite a bit. Um, and uh, one was Bonnie Crumpler, a biologist, and really, got me interested in genetics and how genes made proteins or encoded proteins and how those did chemistry. And I really liked uh, chemistry uh, uh, you know, in those original classes that I took. So I thought, well, can I find a career that, or you know, a source area of study that combines biology and chemistry? And so biochemistry does, uh, although it means so many different things ranging from molecular biology to uh, you know, mainly enzyme catalyzed reactions and everything in between. And so that was a direction I wanted to go. Um, uh, in undergrad, I considered being a pre-med, but really stuck uh, with the trajectory towards research science. Um, I don't think you'd want me to be your physician uh, because I might say, oh, can we leave that control tumor in to see how, you know, how everything's working. So you might, uh, for, uh, medical work was probably not what I was cut out for, but, but I wanted to have an impact uh, and um, engineering biology, uh, studying biochemistry is a way to do that. So it's kind of where I've come from uh, and what, what got me started. This is a reoccurring theme for the guests that we feature on the show is that there is a mentor or influence of sorts all the way from the childhood biochemistry sets, microscopes, etc., all the way to your biology teacher in high school also being a major catalyst for your interest as well. Um, this is really important. These are the ways that we can help unlock the full potential in the youth across the world is to have these mentorships, have these risks, these opportunities, these doors open up for people, have them really pursue them. Um, okay, let's go to how did the interest get you into your, you know, your PhD and into what you were doing in your postdoc work? Like, tell us about that part. So I, um, when I was an undergrad, uh, I did a few things that gave me some perspective. Uh, I worked at nights at a clinical reference laboratory. So that, that sounds exciting, but it really involved centrifuging people's blood samples and, and aliquoting urine samples and things like that and making sure that labels matched on test tubes. Uh, but it was actually an interesting window into the medical field. Yes. And while I had a good time working there, and it, it actually was a good nighttime uh, undergrad compatible job, um, it made me think, eh, not sure I, I really want to go into the medical profession, but it made me think a lot about cell biology and biochemistry because in essence that's what you know, clinical laboratories do on, on these specimens. And at the same time, I did undergraduate work in computational chemistry. So um, computational uh, simulation of small molecules binding to proteins uh, and causing them to change uh, how they do their chemistry. And that was with uh, David Vanderjagt at the University of New Mexico. And as I was wrapping up 
uh, entering my senior year, I had this dilemma that I think many undergrads have was, uh, you know, go into grad school, you know, apply to med school, you know, do something else. And for better or worse, I decided to uh, apply to graduate schools. And I didn't know how competitive I would be, so I applied to various tiers and then ended up with a lot of interviews. Uh, I really um, uh, liked Duke. Uh, I thought their biochemistry department uh, had very interesting research. And uh, at the time, uh, a professor who was chair of the department, Christian Reitz, who ended up being my thesis advisor, uh, had me do an extra interview uh, during my visit to Duke. Uh, with him, and I had no idea I would later join his lab, but there was this infectious enthusiasm for science that he had, and he loaded me down with reprints of his papers, you know, way too many to read, and I had this big stack of reprints that I took home on the airplane, and I ended up going there, ended up working for him, and uh, um, ended up traversing this interesting area from going to essentially theoretically thinking about biochemistry from a, uh, you know, computational docking approach to actually working with the proteins in the lab. And for me, that, that was an eye-opener because yeah. it's, uh, it's one thing to model things, it's another thing to do the wet lab experiments. And so I really appreciated that chance. And I must admit, I wasn't that good at it at first. I had to get my you know, pipette hands yeah. uh, <laughs> working. And, and, uh, and, and, and really, there's, there's a science to that sort of work, but there's also an art. Um, and I think that yeah. uh, that's perhaps underappreciated. So yes. that's how I, how, I end, how I ended up uh, in graduate school. Uh, I actually didn't join my thesis advisor's lab originally. Uh, I joined uh, the lab of an x-ray crystallographer because I specifically wanted to learn how to determine the molecular structures of proteins, uh, where all of the atoms uh, uh, are or likely are uh, in these molecular models that I'd used in, in computational docking. It turns out the professor whose lab I joined was denied tenure, uh, probably for political reasons, not because of productivity or science. And so after a year, I had to switch to another laboratory. And the guy who was loaded me down with reprints uh, of his papers, uh, Chris Rates, convinced me to, to give a try at working in his lab. And he uh, did work on, um, among other things, bacterial membrane biogenesis. So how do bacteria make the coating on them that separates the outside environment from the inside. And if you think about that, that's how I got towards antibiotic uh, yeah. work, so. Oh, cool, that's a good link. Yeah, yeah that's a good link to that. Okay, so uh, bacterial membrane biogenesis. Yeah. Very interesting. So, okay, now you're, this is also cool how you had this, both a, a, like a computational chemistry side and then also a, um, a, a hands-in with the protein and enzyme sort of manufacturing side of, of things with the, in the lab as well. I thought that was, that was good. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to take my like kindergarten understanding of biology and try and up it up to first and second grade over the next like like couple of years if I can if I can get to a better understanding of the central dogma of biology and I think if we can better teach more yeah. young people about the central dogma of biology and then get them to um, make it applicable in the biotech yeah. engineering fields that we have this is going to help with that oh, this hundred trillion dollar opportunity um, okay so now teach us about how that transition happened with Novartis as you were saying with the bacterial membrane biogenesis and stuff too. so so I, I did work uh, in graduate school that, that characterized some of the enzymes, the proteins that do chemistry, that, where that chemistry was necessary for bacteria to make their membranes. And all cells have membranes, and they separate the chemistry that happens inside the cell from whatever's going on on the outside. And uh, it's really one of the defining features of life because it, it's, it contains these self-perpetuating chemical reactions. And so you have to have a division of outside versus inside. And membranes, uh, which are, are usually made mostly of lipids, uh, you know, perform that role. They, they perform that, that separation function. So uh, that's what I, you know, I learned about that in grad school. And I went and did a postdoc at UCSF and I had an opportunity to work with Robert Stroud, a, a very um, a productive crystallographer, uh, and um, uh, was able to uh, solve the crystal structure of 
one of the enzymes that I discovered in grad school. So I did eventually get to do x-ray crystallography, just not when and where I thought I would. And um, I remember how exciting it was uh, when uh, we collected the data sets up on Berkeley uh, Hill up at LBL, uh, the particle accelerator up there. And um, I remember getting a data set that I knew would be good enough to finally write up the work and publish. Uh, and the sun was rising over, you know, it was an all-night shift at the, at the synchrotron. And, and then, uh, you know, I wandered outside to take a coffee break and the sun was rising and I thought, oh, good, this is, we have a, a full story here. Uh, but, you know, so I'd always stayed, I stayed a bit with this theme of uh, membrane biogenesis and enzymes that do work on lipids. And, uh, uh, my postdoc uh, was a little under two years. Uh, in my field, postdocs are taking longer and longer, and we can talk about that maybe later because mm -hmm. I don't think it's a good thing. Uh, but the time came for me to decide what to do next, and I could have stayed as a postdoc for much longer and work on some projects that I had cooking in the lab um, on you know, other proteins. But uh, I had an opportunity uh, to interview at Novartis. Uh, Novartis uh, is a Swiss company, a big pharma company, uh, but it has its infectious diseases program in, or did have its infectious diseases program in Emeryville, California, and uh, had just moved uh, to that site uh, in 2011. Uh, its infectious disease program moved from Cambridge, Massachusetts to Emeryville, so they were hiring up. Yeah. And for me, it was a very lucky thing because I could still be a postdoc now, but uh, I was in the right place at the right time and uh, was lucky enough to get brought onto the team there. And, uh, and, and, and then, among other things, I supported antibiotic uh, discovery uh, uh, projects. Uh, I founded one project, which I ultimately led, uh, and um, uh, participated in many others, uh, and also did uh, tech development and, and discovery, so uh, especially in the areas of protein chemistry. And, um, you know, in that process, it was fun. I got to be uh, both a principal investigator in an, a disease area that I'd studied and really care about, which is antibiotic discovery, which I think we desperately need. And at the same time, I got to learn all these other things about virology, about fungal diseases, about um, oncology and pharma, uh, because the department I was in supported all of those. And uh, it was really a great six years. Uh, I, I um, uh, enjoyed it. and. You know, my group, my former group, will be publishing our work. So you probably know that Novartis uh, pulled the plug on its infectious diseases uh, programs uh, last June or July, I believe, and uh, a few months after I left. And uh, the good news, however, is a lot of that work will be published. Uh, so people will be able to follow on uh, and and build upon what we did there. So um, yeah, so that's kind of how my work evolved into the, the ID world. This is, yeah, it, there's that other connecting link, which is the discovery. You were working on antibiotic yep. discovery, and now it's, again, this, this cell-free molecular discovery. So on the, um, give us a quick bit on the antibiotic discovery as we get into the next one. Just teach us about kind of like what is exactly the cutting edge of that field. Well, it's, it's both... Um, uh, cutting edge, there's things that are cutting edge and there's things that are pretty old fashioned. I mean, in the end of the day, you need compounds that kill the bacteria that you're after, first and foremost. And uh, I guess suppose to put it bluntly, uh, those same compounds can't kill uh, or badly injure the patient. And the good stuff. The good enough. stuff, yeah. the good stuff. And so, you know, in its first you know, principle, what you're trying to do is take bacteria, treat them with molecules, uh, many molecules, millions uh, individually if possible, and see do those molecules kill the bacteria. And uh, if the answer is yes, then you do those experiments more carefully. Uh, sometimes you figure out why they're killing the bacteria. Sometimes you never know exactly what the mechanism is. Uh, and then eventually uh, you have to find out if the molecule is toxic to all types of cells, and that would include animal cells or human cells, then animal studies, uh, then human safety studies, uh, then human efficacy study studies, so sort of the normal uh, yes. progression of drug discovery. Um, but starting with bacteria, and sometimes those projects didn't start with the bacteria. Sometimes they started with an enzyme or a group of enzymes that we knew did essential chemistry for bacteria that did not have equivalence in humans. Because if you're thinking of developing a drug that's an antibacterial, it's best maybe to search for 
ways to mess up the chemistry that the bacteria do, but that humans don't have an equivalent process, because then you're less likely to find uh, compounds that are toxic to humans. And, uh, and that was always the difficulty. So finding those molecules, and, and this really leads into what I'm doing now. Correct. So what we, what we found in Big Pharma, antibiotic discovery, antibacterial discovery, all of, all of Big Pharma's uh, efforts uh, do involve, uh, for on one hand, screening of, of biologics and antibodies, and I'm sure many of the viewers know about that. Um, but not, not all organisms can be targeted with biologics. There's been some work targeting bacteria with biologics and with things called phages, mm -hmm. but still, if you look at the antibiotics that we use, they're small molecules that have to get into the bacteria, they get inside, they mess up the bacteria's biochemistry, they kill the bacteria or prevent them from growing and dividing. And there's a whole and, targeting. And there's a the whole process. targeting issue. Okay. Um, so, but then those same molecules have to have properties that, that are amenable to being drugs. So, you know, they can't be toxic to all cells, yes, especially yes. not the host. And um, they have to be soluble enough to deliver. So one of the great difficulties in drug discovery is are the properties of your molecules. So I think that many people who did medicinal chemistry work, uh, both at Novartis and other companies, would probably agree that the small molecules that humanity searches through when looking for drugs, not just anti-infectives, but all kinds, uh, tend to be not necessarily the types of molecules we would want. Um, they tend to be flat and greasy. There's a great paper called Escape from the Flatlands, talking about the chemical flatlands. And enzymes do chemistry that often do chemistry that humans have a hard time doing. And, and these enzymes are encoded by DNA um, uh, and you know, have evolved in deep time in nature. And, yes. and so this enzymology sort of allows, it maps to a whole universe of chemistry, some of which we know, a lot of which we probably don't know. And that chemistry has properties that makes the molecules sort of the opposite of being flat and greasy. It makes them in many ways more drug-like. So we're, and to be more specific, to have a certain molecular shape, so a three-dimensional shape. And that type of chemistry in general is hard for humans to do, uh, specifically anyway, but it's easy for enzymes to do because they've evolved to do specific chemistry and they don't typically cause side reactions and, and mixtures. Uh, so that was really what got me interested in synthetic biology as a vehicle to find uh, new chemistry yes. uh, to drug targets that we've had difficulty, we being humanity, has had difficulty targeting. And, uh, and that's sort of the central thesis to Tierra Biosciences, where I am now, is can we use small-scale transcription and translation reactions, so reactions that take DNA and that DNA is turned into RNA and that RNA uh, is encoding protein, uh, can we, can we take protein that's encoded by DNA that we put into these reactions, and can those proteins do chemistry uh, as enzymes that allows us to find new, mo new molecular entities? So we're doing a few different things. We're discovering new enzymes, and this is called functional genomics. And then when we mix together groups of enzymes, they do chemistry, uh, and our long-term goal is to find new chemistry in the therapeutic space. Uh, and so. It's, it's really just an evolution of what I started with, um, yes. but it's addressing this unmet problem, uh, uh, unmet need, I think, in, in biopharma discovery, which are small molecules, uh, the non-antibodies, the non-biologics, that have properties that are different than what we typically have in our small molecule libraries. And I think nature is full of these. Uh, yes. Yes. And it, the question is, can we use this platform to discover them? And, uh, and, you know, can we make sense of what we found? Yeah, okay, so there's a massive amount of evolution that's happened, three and a half billion years, especially of bacterial evolution. Sure. And that gives us a, a huge catalog of evolution to look through and to see exactly what sorts of evolutionary strategies exist for us to be able to take from, what molecular production systems occur mm -hmm. in evolution for us to be able to take and apply to our healthcare, or agriculture, etc. And we have that image 
to Ron um, that we'll that we can bring up. So this is you guys leveraging computation and automation into these these tiny little like micro factories that are then brewing up the the different um, seeing how the mo molecules are are affecting what you're teach teach us yeah. about this. Well, what's so to be clear for the viewers. Uh, these are droplets that contain food coloring and water uh, <laughs> because most of, most of our reactions are clear. And uh, someone once asked me what I did, and I said, well, how deeply do you want me to describe it? And I said, it's indirectly observing things that happen when I mix some small volumes of clear liquid with other small volumes of clear liquid. And if you explain it that way, people think you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. this is for artistic effect. But, but yes, in seriousness, what we do um, is we, we, make, uh, we make these sort of cell-free factories, and, and we make them by grinding up cells, uh, um, uh, separating their components out. So we take you know, living cells, so they can be bacteria, they can be other things, and we grind them up so they're no longer living. They no longer have that separation between you know, external environment and internal environment. But we do so in a way that preserves their ability to take DNA that we put in, you know, that we add, you know, exogenously yeah. and make RNA from that, that DNA and then make proteins from that RNA. And um, there's a few interesting, there's a few reasons why this is, this is interesting and why these cell-free, you know, pr factories, if, if you want to mm -hmm. call them that, are, are helpful. Uh, one reason is that we can add whatever we want to the reaction. And this is, allows us to prototype um, what might be called unnatural natural chemistry. So sometimes enzymes can use, can act on molecules that they wouldn't normally see in nature, but we can add those molecules from the outside to our reactions because they're open. We don't have to get them into an organism. Uh, the other thing is that we can print pieces of DNA and we can layer many of those inside one of these reactions also because they're open. Uh, so we can, we can mix and match which proteins we're making. And, and introduce diversity in the products of those enzymes uh, uh, by doing that. The other thing that's really important, and it's subtle, but it bears repeating, is that because these are not living organisms, but they maintain this ability to make proteins from you know, DNA, uh, we are able to discover enzymes that might be toxic to the host. So if you engineered yeast or bacteria to make a certain enzyme, uh, and many companies do this, and it's, it's a really good way uh, to, to discover biochemistry. Um, what you don't find is you don't find the enzymes that their mere expression in the host makes them toxic. And so that's sort of like a dark, uh, dark area of, of enzymatic space um, of biochemistry that is not easy to uncover if you, say, take um, a gene from algae that you've gotten from, you know, molecular bioprospecting of the oceans, for instance, and you put that into E. coli and you say, okay, can E. coli make this gene and is it functional? Sometimes the answer is yes, but sometimes you just don't get anything or the E. coli die because just the expression of that gene is bad for them. So because we don't have any, any we, compare, we preserve some components of a living system, but it's really not alive. And thus, you know, it doesn't have a way of, of you know, kicking out a plasmid or uh, slowing down its growth uh, in response to making something toxic. This allows us to uncover things you wouldn't normally see. And so, you know, this is a hypothesis. We're, yeah. we're still in the process of testing this. But we think that this will allow us to prospect in areas where some other platforms can't. Um, and, uh, of course, as a business model, it's... it's uh, an experiment too. Uh, yeah. You know, will this be will this be valuable uh, to the synthetic biology world? Uh, is is sort of a question that, uh, uh, as a company, we're testing by our very work. Yeah, yeah. The, linking this all the way. Let's see if I can take some steps all the way back to where you were initially teaching us about what you were discovering when you got into the the first sort of um, labs where you're where you're putting um, uh, like blood samples into centrifuges and stuff so and then bring it up all the way here so when 
when you're taking like blood and putting it in a centrifuge, centrifuge is the main producer is Illumina, right? Of centrifuges. Oh, you're thinking about sequences. Sequ Illumina sequencers, is doing yeah. So, so centrifuges just spin things they fast. They spin things yeah. fast. And yeah. there's there's many producers of those. Okay. And that that work was not very scientific. It was yes, more procedural. Yes. It was yes. separate. Yes. So, yeah. this, so here's where I'm interested. Okay. This is what this is kind of what I want to break down. So Illumina's main is doing the newest gen sequencing. Yep. And they do that through a process of breaking down the double helix and writing out the nucleotides. Somehow they do that. We'll, well just leave it at that. Yeah. That, that'll we'll you leave can... it at that. Centrifuges are spinning around things like blood and then making it so that you can take a specific part of the blood and go and sample. That. Precisely. Okay. So then. Now, um, when you're doing things like, you know, you were talking earlier about, about, about you take like an actual uh, a, 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 a bacterial cell and you're, you're kind of, you were giving this example of, you know, you were teaching me initially when you were about, about how DNA and RNA and proteins, that this process is kind of all happening in a chaos theory way. It's not necessarily step to step to step at a time. They're all influencing each other at the same time. And yes, do you, I have, I, I, okay. Well, we learn it, we learn yes. it in a step to step way. We um, learn in a step to step way, but they're constantly influencing in, in, each other. In real living organisms, uh, it's much different. Uh, I gave a talk that you attended yes. uh, called uh, something along the lines of uh, DNA is not computer code. Uh, and I think this is an important point. So yes, DNA is a template for RNA, which you can think of as a temporary message, which is a template for making proteins. Um, and, but really, it's not one-to-one -one mapping. Yes. And there's, and so I think that's what you're referring to, yes, right? Yes, yes, correct. And then the, when, what is, what's encoded in the DNA is then the RNA will, will take what's encoded in the DNA and act as a messenger to the ribosome. Yep. And then the ribosome will take that message and then make a protein. Yes. And then the protein is an enzyme. Sometimes it's an enzyme, sometimes it's a structural component of a cell. So an enzyme is a protein that catalyzes chemistry. It catalyzes further chemistry. Yeah. And so usually proteins are enzymes because they want often, to catalyze something. Right? Often, but they, they can be very often structural components of cells because cells have structure. And so there's proteins that are just, they're literally structural building blocks. Uh, so yes. not all of them catalyze chemistry. Not all of them catalyze. Okay. So now we take what you're describing earlier about taking a single cell or cells and you're like, you're kind of like running them. Like yeah, you grind them up. Grind them up. However you, you by turn different on a methods. Blender. Well, yeah, I know. <laughs> How do you grind up the cells first? Well, uh, or lyse the cells. We, uh, we do it a number of different ways. Um, sometimes just by putting them under high pressure and squeezing them through a small aperture. A small uh, aperture. So then you have shear forces that rip yeah, them that apart. Yeah, rip them apart. Uh, now, now, but the cell can't actually. It's not. It's not living anymore at that point. But at you, that point, it's not alive. But you can take the DNA, RNA, ribosomes, protein, enzymes within it and take those and then bring them into these. Yes. And then you can add your own DNA, exogenous DNA. Exactly. And then now you're saying, okay, mixture. Do. Do. Chemistry for us. Chemistry yeah. for us. But if it's toxic to a cell that's living, we might still see it in those reactions where we wouldn't see it necessarily in a cell. So that's, it's, Interesting. we've lost some of the regulatory machinery yeah. that yeah, cells yeah. use to keep themselves happy. Okay. But. So then you'd have to retest. In, in the in organism. A, in an organism. Yeah. Okay. Because something may end up being uh, non-toxic here, but toxic in the exactly. cell's environment. Yeah. So, okay. so the, here we use this for rapid prototyping and. Yes, rapid and prototyping, because there's what, this looks like a thousand or of these little uh, factories. Yeah, yeah. So, and we can do these in, in, you know, five microliter um, and smaller volumes. So it's, you know, smaller than a, a a droplet that would come out of, say, a medicine dropper. Five uh, microliters. So, wow. And, and yeah. it's, uh, you know, so it's a way we can, we can do many experiments quickly. And then you imagine there's a, a potentially really interesting data back end on that. Yeah. Because correct. we know what 
DNA sequences we've put in. We know other things that we've done to these reactions. So, and because the experiments are well controlled and, and are done in, you know, uh, multiples and, and, you know, in proximity to each other and with, with many things controlled, we can learn things about what are determinants of a protein's function. So, for instance, uh, you know, from the sequence, we can, we can test many, many sequences to say, you know, oh, in this sequence space, this portion of it encodes, um, you know, functional acyl transferases, a certain type of enzyme, but maybe this actually does something different. And so we can quickly test those hypotheses. And that's, that's on the route to using these mixtures uh, to make drug-like molecules, is, is understanding what the enzymes actually do. Because you can predict computationally, and that, that's one of the things that's driven forward synthetic biology, is the ability to look at a protein sequence that's encoded, or a DNA sequence, figure out what protein that might encode, uh, and if that protein's an enzyme, predict what chemistry it might do. But still a large amount of that is not known. So there's a really a big need to empirically test these hypotheses, and our platform is one way of doing yes. it. Yes. Now, why would you then not take just a bunch of, why do, you, why do you do the grinding up process and put it into these five microliter um, containers rather than maybe just have cells themselves and then put your DNA in the cell environment? So, times 1,000. Yeah, yeah. So, so people do that. Um, yeah. But one thing is, is that um, how you assemble the DNA that goes in those organisms is often a bit more complicated than what we do. Um, uh, often people put, say, a, a, a replicating plasmid into, say, an E. coli, and a plasmid is a piece of circular DNA, uh, copies of which can be made, and it's used to drive expression. And as cells divide, if, say, it's a bacteria, the daughter cells get copies of this, of this plasmid. And, you know, one can, you know, make knock-ins to, you know, genomic DNA and things like that. So is With it easier to add any DNA you want to when the cells grind it up versus when it's in its yeah it's organism. generally easier because we don't have to play tricks to get it into the cell play tricks well to get it and and I wouldn't call them the tricks are are yeah. standard in the field <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, there's nothing weird about it but yeah. uh, um, it it it, it, it it takes that layer of complexity out and it also takes out the layer of complexity where what you've put into the cells makes the cells not happy for some reason or another. Okay. And then they either don't make what you want the, them okay. to make, or they die, they or... They push out the exogenous DNA easier uh, in the non-crushed-up uh, environment. Yeah, if they're, if they're a living organism, they'll do okay. whatever they have to to make themselves as fit as possible. But here, we don't, you know, our reactions aren't evolving. They're just, they're, doing doing. they're just doing transcription and translation and other chemistry too. Now, okay, now there's a couple questions that came to my mind, okay. First question is, how do you decide what exogenous DNA you're adding to these? First question, and second question is, how the hell do you actually compute what's happening inside of these? So there's a, those are both great questions. So when what we decide to put in, uh, can really be any sort of hypothesis we want to test. So I'll give you an example. Um, maybe we have a whole class of um, enzymes called cytochrome P450s. So they're, uh, they're enzymes that do a particular type of chemistry, and we have a panel of them uh, that we, we know their sequences uh, because they've been published or they're, they're from organisms that have been sequenced by someone somewhere. And we want to test that whole panel of enzymes, each individually, for their ability to do something to a molecule that we're interested in. So we put the DNA encoding those enzymes, one piece of DNA for one enzyme into each reaction, and then we have the small molecule that we're interested in yes. in each reaction. And then on the back end, you know, we let the reaction run, we have a way that we can determine if we've made um, RNA message. And then, uh, depending on how we set it up, uh, we can determine if we've made the protein that we're interested in. Because only new proteins that, got made, that get made in these reactions will be tracked. And so we can differentiate between what's new that's been made versus okay. what came along with the cells. Okay. And, then, and then if we've made our small molecule or changed our small molecule, the back end would look like liquid chromatography or mass spectrometry or all these quantitative ways 
um, to characterize small molecules. Okay, so let me see if I can get this right. So you're, you have, uh, you already know the, en the enzyme's chemistry that's happening. Well, it's predicted chemistry. It's predicted chemistry that's happening. So you have yeah. a predicted chemistry, then you add a molecule, then you're adding something into the different um, the enzymes, the different yeah. enzymes, and then you're you're when you're computationally mapping what's happening in each one of the experiments, you're logging only what the novel protein. Yeah, the new proteins that are made, we can see. You can see those, and then you, and then somehow you turn goo into. Well, code into, sort of, into, yeah. Into knowledge. To knowledge. Well, <laughs> right now, right now, it's a, it's actually an exercise in data handling in in a yeah. way because yeah. it gets really complicated. You have to track everything that's going into each reaction, track what's going on in that reaction, and then track your readout at the end, which will be specific often for what you're trying to make. So there's general learnings that we get from every reaction we run, which is how well and how much of um, our protein of interest that we're trying to make in that given reaction, that enzyme of interest, how, how much of it are we able to make relative to its cousins or, or, or uh, orthologs that we're testing. But on the other side of it, um, what small molecules or what, what chemistry those enzymes are doing, you know, that readout will be different from class of enzyme to class of enzyme. So it's all these layers of data and we, we think that there's um, interesting and not obvious <sighs> things to learn. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, because if you take the massive catalog of enzymes and enzymatic chemistry that occurs, and then if whatever small, tiny, tiny percent that we understand is probably less than 1% of all of it that we actually get. And then we're trying to understand what the other 99% does and then apply that to agriculture and healthcare. Exactly. And that, that's very exciting. That, that's the stuff that also gets me like, it gets me salivating about what biology knows that like we don't know and how we can apply that to our lives. And that's the exactly. $120 opportunity that exists. But to be clear, it isn't easy. And, yeah, um, and even the big players, you know, there's big players in the field who've done really amazing work, uh, Ginkgo Bioworks and Zymergen and Amaris and, you know, a lot of the companies that have pushed the molecular discovery in synthetic biology forward have been doing it in organism. And we hope to add to that toolbox uh, that they've, yes. they've started. We hope to add cell-free prototyping and uh, you know, see where we can go with that in terms of prospecting uh, for new chemical matter. Interesting. So it's, it's uh, yeah. but, but technically there's, there's engineering challenges, there's uh, data handling challenges, and biology is hard yes. because it's unpredictable. So Yeah, yeah. And then you have to replicate this because if yeah. it works one time, you want to replicate it again to make exactly. sure it came out the same result. And so this is the you know, this kind of segues us into what, exactly. we want to, what we want to talk about next. But I just find it interesting that on one side it's called, you know, you use cells for discovery. Yep. On the other side, you don't use cells, but you actually took cells and blended them up. And, then, and use their components. And use yeah. their components <laughs> that they're dead. And then, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. it's funny, the cell-free discovery. Um, okay, so, okay, let's segue then. So we're talking about this in a fascinating way right now where, you know, if you come out, if you're, comp if you're, if your computation's producing, um, um, your test is producing a certain computation and your readout is something and you're like, aha, interesting, then what you have to do is you have to do that again. Yep. Because you want to verify. If you verify it three, four, 20 times, you're like, okay, we can probably say with like 99% accuracy, this is right. And so that's how you do science. Yep. That's the scientific method. That is testing your hypothesis over and over again. And we've seen so many instances where this foundation of knowledge, you're very passionate about this, and I'm excited to talk about this foundation of scientific literature and knowledge that we've built on has these like little cracks and they're kind of like sometimes the, the, the way that we handle academia isn't in the most conducive way. Um, so teach us about the way that you want to um, inspire people to rewrite the scientific playbook and rewrite the incentives, because I love this. So, so it's, it's, one of, it's one of motivations. And so if you view science as an ecosystem, 
you have many different players. You have universities, you have private companies, you have um, not-for-profit institutes uh, and NGO type organizations uh, and, and a lot of things in between. Uh, and you have amateur scientists uh, who are operating on their own uh, or in groups and all of, this, all of this is really good. But they all have different strengths and weaknesses and have different motives. And in academia, uh, especially in academic science, I think the motive is often priority. So if you want your grants to be funded, you have to have a paper that shows that you are the first to describe something. And I feel that that, we, even without ill intent, that tends to motivate people to oversell what they've discovered and maybe not be as careful about reproducing it before they publish it uh, as they should. And then companies like Novartis, where I worked, and, and, and companies like Tira Biosciences, where I currently work, and other academic labs and people all over the place will sometimes depend on that literature to guide them and won't be able to reproduce the data. And no one really has put a number to this to my knowledge, though I may be wrong, but I think it, it represents a huge opportunity cost uh, in time and money. And uh, I really think that we should incentivize people uh, in academia to publish derivative works as well as novel ones, yeah. where those derivative works show within them that a whole other study can be reproduced. And, uh, and there's movements to do this, and I think open access publishing yeah. uh, in general is, is a good thing. Um, you know, most of the science, uh, the, the basic research done in the U.S. anyway is funded by the public in, you know, one form or another. And so I think that it's really key that publicly funded science be available to the public and be as reproducible as possible because there's huge sections of the economy that depend upon that. And, and then, then this gets to education. You know, I, I mean, I won't be shy about it. I think that academic education in, or education in the sciences is uh, a pyramid scheme. And again, it's, it is a pyramid <laughs> scheme. It, it, it's not because of ill intent, but Damn. the way the funding model works is if you're a faculty member and you want to keep the grants coming in, yeah. you need people to do the research that makes the papers that help yeah, yeah. make the case for your grants. And so the model works when there's more trainees than there are terminal uh, people at the top of the pyramid, professors or deans. Uh, and so you see this huge number of postdoctoral fellows and graduate students being trained for a very small number of professorships uh, that are open in any given year. And it, it's a matter of narrative, which I think is really important and we need to change in science, that becoming a research professor is not the only thing that you can do yes. with that training yes. um, on one hand. And on the other hand, can we be more efficient about how we educate and train scientists? And I know education and training are actually a bit divergent, but you know, on one hand, can we train scientists to be passionate about their science at the level of philosophy which you know, a PhD would imply, but doesn't often yeah. can, you know, confer. Yeah. Uh, and on the other hand, can we train people to do what they need to in the laboratory and have touched different techniques to push specific research forward? And I just really think, re I think rethinking that is really important. And that's why I'm involved, um, among other things, with IndieBio. Yep. Because I think that if, like I, if I could go back again, if I was finishing grad school, uh, and even though I had a good experience in my postdoc, uh, I would definitely um, probably go to a, a startup accelerator yeah. uh, or incubator of some sort, uh, just because it's you learn a lot that way, yes. and it's in many ways comparable to doing a postdoctoral yeah. you know, fellowship. So I think we need to 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 incentivize reproducible research in academia, and um, and and in, and in industry it, it's sort of different. Like within your own company, with it's essential that people can reproduce work. And so, if anything, uh, the motivation goes a bit far the opposite direction, is there's an emphasis on, you know, reproducible protocols, but then there's less bandwidth to do novel work. So, I think that what academia is good at and what industry is good at in science are not always the same thing. They're often the same thing, but not always. And for a healthy ecosystem, you need both to be, you know, everything to be healthy. So. You know, we need to rethink, you know, can we train graduate students in the sciences with a funding mechanism that doesn't require a pyramid scheme to make it work? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, can we build bridges to industry? And I, I think, you know, uh, that's being done. 
Uh, but can we think of creative ways to train people and educate people in the sciences that don't take all of their 20s uh, and you know, don't end them, uh, you know, land them in a postdoc where they you know, get paid like 40K a year uh, regardless of where they live and do their research and then are starting their career in their you know, early to late 30s yeah. doing something after that. So I really think we need to be more respectful of, of students' time. Yes. Um, and, and then you know, the other thing is this. There's a better way to, for the edge of knowledge to be explored more effectively, reproduce the results, incentivize that, as well as when you're at the edge of knowledge, how do you get the kids in their in their, even in their teens to start kind of playing around at that edge of knowledge with the right mentors and with the right strategies and then get them to the point where you're not in your mid-30s before you're even starting to dabble potentially in industry related um, progress. Yeah, and, and you know, and it's also, it, it ties into how we communicate science to the public. I mean, the public Absolutely. by and large doesn't realize uh, what one of my colleagues uh, once called the postdoc postdoc ap apocalypse, uh, postdocalypse, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, this just isn't generally, I think, known about, and it should be discussed because it, this comes at a great cost to human potential. But I think the other, the other thing to talk about, and what I'm personally interested in, is changing the narrative of science. So um, scientists are often portrayed a certain way in the media, uh, a yep. certain way in literature. Agreed. And, um, brilliant, I think, brilliant uh, yeah, and, people uh, that have just but so passionately been aiming to push the things that we have around us, these brilliant yeah. devices, what we're using right now to stream, yeah. um, the, the vehicles that we're driving, the, the, the medicines that we get at the healthcare institutions, et cetera. These are all aspects of brilliant scientific burdens of geniuses that people have taken on to pursue. But an important point of that is almost all those discoveries were team efforts. There were and, team and I think exactly. we hundreds, thousands exactly, of and I think yeah. we have to get away from this idea of a heroic scientist one doing yeah. heroic research in the lab yeah. that so opens up, up a whole field. I mean, it sometimes happens. Sometimes, yeah. But but yeah. it's really better to think of it as a team exercise. And then if you think yeah. of it in that way, one should ask oneself: Well, how cognitively diverse are scientists really? Are we losing people from the field who our discoveries and our creativity would be better for them? but maybe their personalities and minds work differently than what we're selected for in, in science. So, so to get through a, you know, a PhD in biochemistry, um, you have to be willing to live on a lot of ramen noodles and you know, uh, th there's a certain selective pressure, right? Because yeah. people will say, screw this, I'm gonna go get a job in finance or I'm going to do something that allows me to you know, be able to travel on weekends or you know, things of that sort. So, it selects for a certain type of person, the yes. current way we're doing it. Yes, yes. And what I'd like to, to do outside of my work with Tierra and with some, some friends and colleagues, uh, we started uh, Biocaptivate, uh, Biocaptivate yeah. a, a not-for-profit that we're going to, we're in the process of launching to sort of bring these conversations to broader uh, uh, discussion is how do, we, how, do we, um, how do we nurture cognitive uh, um, diversity in the sciences? And, and how, do we, how do we find inspiration at, for instance, the intersection of art and science, yes. the arts and the sciences, yes. which are not in opposition, but in fact uh, should work together. together. Yeah. And, and so anyway, this is, yeah. the, this is what I'm interested in um, beyond just biochemistry. And I, I think that there's an important place for that. I love it. And give me your one thought, because we'll have to have you back to talk more about um, an update on Tierra as well as more on the Scientific sure. Foundation knowledge. But give me your thought on how to best, you know, we find ourselves like, again, back to the beginning as stewards of Earth, 8 billion of us, exponential technology. Um, we evolved so quickly. What is the ideal well-functioning republic for you? Uh, in the U.S. or like, as a, like, for a species? Yeah, for yeah. a species. Like, what would be some of these principles? You're such a first principles thinker. Well, I mean, I think that this freedom to, you know, within certain parameters, uh, live life how one wants to, use one's time how one wants to, especially uh, to be given permission, permission to be creative. Yeah. I think that this is really important. And I think that, uh, a responsibility for society also should temper that that individualistic impulse. So I think that we should individuals should have a great freedom to explore, to be creative, 
uh, but that at the same time we recognize certain principles that have to be upheld for the good of everyone uh, as a group. And I mean, I think you know, obviously, certain you know, public order and 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 um, uh, you know, freedom of speech and and you know, fair legal processes are all important. But I, I really think one thing that that I fear is slipping uh, that that an ideal republic would have would be the ability of any child, uh, no matter if they're born wealthy or you know, at the lowest end of the spectrum of you know, fi family wealth that that society might have, to have equal access to the same quality of education. That and, is, and, amen. And, and if, yeah. if they choose to take advantage of it, um, and yes. they should be encouraged to, yes. I think we really have to do that because think of who we might be losing we you are know, losing so many brilliant thinkers. Just because they weren't in the right place right. to get Roll that education. Dice. Yeah, to and get it. so to me, like that's really important. Me too. And that's why that's why, you know, we're yeah. on we're on that same wavelength there. I'm glad you said that that people born into the world get to pass their time how they so choose to, absolutely, and also that equality of opportunity for people to pursue whatever they want with their time, with that exactly. creative potential. So at least if the baseline is there for everyone exactly. to pursue. Okay, we'll unpack that more soon. Okay, the two quick questions on the way sure. out. This is simulation. Ah. Are we in a simulation? Oh, I don't know. Not enough data. <laughs> Classic scientist. Uh, Wait, give me your best imagination on if we're in a simulation. Oh, uh, makes me think of like the brain in the vat type experiment. Oh, I don't know. Well, then how do you explain dreams? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Uh, are those simulations inside a simulation? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, it's a it's a pretty hard hypothesis to test, right? It's yeah. a good one to poke with the scientific probe. You're kind of running little simulations in all of your little tests we are. that are happening. That's interesting. Yeah. That's how we like to think about it as well. Okay, last question. Sure. What's the most beautiful thing in the world? Most beautiful thing in the world. You know, I think the most beautiful thing in the world uh, is honestly, you know, waking up wherever you are and knowing that you're going to have another day uh, that's going to be different than the last. I think if everything was the same, it would be boring. And I think that, that there's just a, there's a beauty in, in the unknown and, yeah. and in possibilities. So I think, yeah, the most beautiful thing are the possibilities that, that one might see. Oh, that's great, Lewis. That was a good answer. I like that one a lot, too. All right, this has been such a pleasure. I feel yeah, like I've pleasure. upgraded myself to at least the first day of first grade. In <laughs> by the time. Nice to, thank you for having me. Really appreciate Thanks. it. Yeah, this has been such a pleasure. Really appreciate it. Keep up all the great work Thanks. with Tierra Biosciences and everything else, BioCaptivate. Everyone, check out the links below to Lewis's work. Also, go follow Lewis on Twitter. Follow him on LinkedIn as well. Go check out his work. Also, a huge shout out to Ron Vargas for producing and directing. Major thank you. We greatly appreciate you. Everyone, give us your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you on the topics that we talked about. How can you pursue the frontier of synthetic biology as well yourselves? Go and crack at that edge. Go and build on it, everyone. Also, support the artists and entrepreneurs that you love, that you want to see succeed. Go and support them. All our links are below. Keep supporting them in your communities. Also, Build the future. Manifest your dreams into the world, everyone. Inspire others in your communities and around the world. We love you so much, and we will see you soon. Peace.